Greetings, everyone. We're uh, going to talk now about this fascinating concept of Satyagraha, which uh, many people think is Gandhi's most characteristic and probably greatest gift to the modern world. Uh, now, the term Satyagraha is used today in slightly different senses, so I want to clarify what I'm talking about. Sometimes it's used for the entire principle of nonviolence in all its aspects. Sometimes it's used for the resistance aspect in contrast to, say, constructive program or negotiation. So Gandhi will say, the negotiations broke down and now I have to relaunch Satyagraha. Or, you know, we've tried constructive program, the opposition has not responded, it's time for Satyagraha. In 1942, when Satyagraha was ruled out on a mass scale because of the fact that the British had entered into World War II, he launched a Satyagraha of one. So it's used for the whole principle of nonviolence. It's used for direct active resistance as opposed to other methods of persuasion or in, co in uh, complementarity with them. And it's also used in the specific sense of a given Satyagraha, like the Salt Satyagraha or the Vicom Temple Road Satyagraha. So I'll be mostly talking about that second cadre there. It's, uh, we're not talking now about constructive program. We have another talk on that. We're not talking about normal kinds of constitutional, legal interaction, we're petitions and so forth. We're talking about what happens when the opposition has not responded and you need to exert suasion on them, but you don't believe in violence. So let me talk a little bit about this term. Uh, it was actually developed in 1908, about the second year of Gandhi's first major campaign in South Africa. And he invented the term because what he was doing was so badly misunderstood that people were calling it by the wrong word. They were trying to liken it to the next most similar thing that they were familiar with, which was passive resistance. Uh, if it's possible to drive a Mahatma up a wall, this use of the term passive resistance drove Gandhi up the wall. He couldn't stand it because it's not passive. It's the opposite of passive. By the time I'm finished describing it to you, I hope you will see that nothing could be more active. And it's not locked into resistance. When the opposition yields, like he had a very good relationship with one of the viceroys, the head of the British supreme power in India, uh, Lord Irwin. And he would have conversations. They'd reach a lot of compromises. And so there's, there's nothing resistant about that. They were gentlemen negotiating. So passive resistance was a totally misleading term. But what was an acceptable term? Uh, Nonviolence would really only enter the English language some years later, in about 1926. So he held a contest, and one of his nephews came up with the term Sud Agraha, and he said, you know, that's almost it. And he just did a slight grammatical riff on that and came out with Satyagraha. So the word is based on a specifically Sanskrit concept, which is really helpful, really useful for us to grasp. It's the concept of sat, or satya, which is actually a remote relative to the English word is, and it means that which is. So it actually has three meanings wrapped up into one. It means, most importantly, <coughs> reality, that which is as opposed to non-existence. It means truth as opposed to fiction or non-truth. And, most importantly, it means what's good as opposed to what is not good. So those three are kind of woven together in his consciousness as an inheritor of uh, Hindu tradition. And uh, the ah part in the middle is just a little prefix meaning towards, and the root grah means to grab. It's related actually to our word grab, to hold. 
So it's a very vivid image, Satyagraha is. It means grabbing hold of the truth and holding on to it for all you're worth. When people are attacking you, you're going to tend to feel that they're your enemy. That's not truth. You cling to the truth of your unity despite all the tension and the confusion. Um, now, it's unfortunate that this is a Sanskrit term, but we don't actually have a very good English equivalent. So let's, it is kind of creeping into our vocabulary. So let's just use it. Now, what did it mean and why did he use these terms? What is this truth that you're holding on to? Well, in his book, Satyagraha in South Africa, which I warmly recommend to everyone, he has a marvelous quote, which goes something like this. The world rests upon a bedrock of satya or truth. In other words, this idea that something has come out of nothing, that the world was a void and it was somehow you know, constructed, that's, that's not real. Everything that we can experience in the phenomenal world, everything that we can experience inside us and, and as our window onto the spiritual world is based on an ultimate reality. In fact, in the Sanskrit epics, there was a phrase, um, uh, satyam eva jayate, truth alone prevails. And in fact, that's the motto of the modern state of India. Satyam eva jayate, narnartam, that which is unreal can never prevail. And this is what uh, Gandhi is building around. He says, the world rests upon a bedrock of satya or truth. Uh, asatya or untruth since it does not so much as exist, its victory is out of the question. Satya, because it is all that is, the, its failure is out of the question. So sat in the long run, although there's lots of confusion and setbacks on the surface, in the long run, truth alone prevails. And if you can find a mechanism of dealing with your fellow human beings on the basis of that truth, you are bound to succeed, maybe not in the short term, maybe not immediately. But it's been said of Satyagraha by one of Gandhi's biographers that Satyagraha was the kind of thing where you could lose all the battles and end up winning the war because you're keyed into that ineluctable, invincible power of truth. Okay, so what is this truth that we're clinging to to make ourselves into uh, truth warriors or uh, this implementers of soul force, which is how Satyagraha is sometimes translated? There's a long quote by a, a Southern writer, Marshall Frady, about Martin Luther King that I'd like to share with you. It says a lot. We won't have time to go over all of it, but it really sums up very beautifully what this truth is and how a nonviolent actor, a satyagrahi, as a person who uses satyagraha, what they are implementing, what they're banking on. So King started from the essentially religious persuasion, Frady says, that in each human being, black or white, whether deputy sheriff or manual laborer or governor, there exists, however tenuously, That'll be an important point for us. It's not always on the surface, but it's in there, however tenuously, a certain natural identification with every other human being. Such that in the overarching design of the universe, which ultimately connects us all together, we tend to feel that what happens to our fellow human beings in some way also happens to us. I want to stop here for just a second because in the last 30 years, scientists have discovered that we have in our central nervous system, in our brains, special neurons. They call them mirror neurons. There's one scientist who actually calls them Gandhi neurons, which I kind of like. The purpose of which is specifically to respond exactly to the state of mind and the behavior of another person. So if I go like this, the neurons that would cause your arm to go like this, they fire off. Your brain has to intercept it at the last minute. So say to yourself, well, no, wait, that's Michael Nagler doing that. I don't have to do that. So we tend to feel that what happens to our fellow human beings in some way also happens to us. And we now know the physiological component of that. So that no man 
can continue to debase or abuse another human being without eventually feeling in himself at least some dull answering hurt and stir of shame. Therefore, in the catharsis of a live confrontation with wrong, when an oppressor's violence is met with a forgiving love, he can be vitally touched and even at least momentarily reborn as a human being, while the society witnessing such a confrontation will be quickened in conscience towards compassion and justice. Now that was a mouthful, but I think this is uh, really the best and the most complete description of Satyagraha and how it works that I know of. Um, so this is the truth, this is the vision that a Satyagrahi clings to. Uh, she or he sees life as an interconnected whole. He or she believes that that wholeness has a component, an element inside even the most debased, the most dehumanized oppressor, that that oppressor actually does not want to oppress on some level, and that the Satyagrahi can awaken that response, that awareness in the other person. As human beings, we have access to one another's awareness. Usually this has to happen in, in Satyagraha. It has to happen by taking on the suffering that's resident in a situation instead of inflicting it on others. And that turns people around and awakens them. And we can you tell you hundreds of examples of this kind of thing. So the vision is that the universe is one. We're all embraced in an overarching unity and that there is a meaning to it, there is a purpose to it with which a satyagrahi can cooperate. Mind you, you don't have to totally buy into this vision in order to practice what other people call nonviolence. If you simply don't use violence, you also can awaken at least less threat in the opponent. But the real satyagrahi will have some sense of this vision, consciously or not. There'll also be an emotional component to this. Uh, if an opponent threatens me, I'm normal, or, or ordinary human being here, I'm going to respond with fear and anger. So I have a choice. Do I act out that fear by running away? Do I act out that anger by trying to defend myself? Or do I say, I am not going to sink to this level, as Martin Luther King says, I'm never going to let anyone bring me so low as to make me hate him. I control that emotion and find a way of opening the heart of the opponent. And miraculously, this is not a case of repression, it's a case of unconscious conversion, of redirection. Martin Luther King said, we did not lead to outbursts of anger, we expressed anger under discipline for maximum effect. Long term, he was absolutely correct. As long as we tried to solve problems by violence, what happens? We are lurching from crisis to crisis and things get continually worse. If we try to solve them through nonviolence using satyagraha, we may not even succeed in the short run, but in the long run they get better and better. We're building human relationships, we're changing the ambience of, so, of human consciousness. Now this uh, power, I called it emotional, but it's really kind of a spiritual energy, releasing a kind of a living power, as Gandhi called it. It's been there all along. Gandhi did not discover it. In the year 39 of our era, uh, Jews in Jerusalem, were, their religion was deeply threatened by the emperor Calig Caligula, who wanted to set up statues of himself in the temple in Jerusalem. This was absolutely unacceptable to the Jews. On the other hand, it was perfectly unrealistic for them to fight back. So they went uh, and stood in front of the person who was in charge, his name was Petronius, and said, this is not okay. He said, I'm sorry, I've got orders from the emperor, I'm gonna do it. They said, you'll have to kill us. The soldiers took out their swords and all of these people who had flocked in from all parts of Palestine lay down, exposed their necks and said, go ahead, kill us. You can kill all of us, but we're not gonna live with this kind of world. So they were unconsciously using the final recourse in Satyagraha 
which is to be able to risk your life. Incidentally, note, not one of them perished. But Petronius said, I can't go through with this. What's the point of ruling over a country where all the people are killed? Uh, he wrote a letter to Caligula, said, let's reconsider. Caligula writes back to him and says, please commit suicide. But fortunately, Caligula was assassinated before the letter got to Petronius. Anyway, make a long story short, Satyagraha has been around ever since consciousness has been around. What did Gandhi do? He made a science out of it. He systematized it and he built it out from the spontaneous, like what we see in 39 CE, to the strategic. He built it out from the individual, what Martin Luther King, Luther King would call the love ethic of Jesus, to a mass social movement that lasted 30 years, if it needed to, to bring India its independence. So he was by far the most articulate and the most experienced exponent. He showed us how to use it. He proved that it could be used in every single imaginable situation. There is no situation in which it cannot be used. Sometimes it's going to hurt. Sometimes it's going to hurt a lot. But there is no situation in which Satyagraha will not work. He said toward the end of his life, I have tried this experiment. Notice the scientific vocabulary. I have tried this experiment for 50 years. I have known of no single incident in which it has failed. I may have failed as an instrument of it, but the principle of Satyagraha is infallible and universally applicable. So this is an incredible discovery uh, and probably the keynote of Gandhi's legacy. This is what he did with it. He, and he discovered it in himself when he was challenged by the racism and the violence that he encountered in South Africa. He tested it very rigorously, he found that it worked, and he systematically built it up over a period of 30 years until he brought down the greatest empire the world had ever known without firing a shot. Uh, that's what he did. Now, what can we do? Uh, I don't think I'm about to bring down any empires with or without firing shots. But we can learn about this. It's a science. It can be learned cognitively like any other. We can practice it in our daily interactions. And when we have seen it to work, we can do speaking and writing and help to change this violent uh, culture and ambience in which we live so that the world will be made a safer place for Satyagraha, and Satyagraha will give us a world of peace and freedom and justice. Inshallah. Thank you very much.